a 2-0 win, a 4-0 win, five-star performances. This is the Borough Breakdown podcast, and this is our Borough Mash Day Chatter in a pod. One support. Curtis Fleming is there on the edge of the air. Fleming for That's Craig it. Hignett. Hit it, Higgy. Higgy hits the track. Abanelli coming alive again. Janino wants the ball played to him. Abanelli spots out. Hello and welcome to the Borough Breakdown podcast with Johnny, Dana and Tom. We're well, the Borough podcast that gives you all of your Borough Match Day chatter in a podcast in five in a row. It's five in a row. It's five in a row. It's five star performances. We beat Sunderland 4 0. We beat Cardiff 2 0. We're on the up. We're going to win it all and uh, there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> and, and welcome, of course. Uh, Middlesbrough, of course, have had a fantastic week uh, in the EFL and Middlesbrough are getting climbing and slowly climbing up the championship table. Uh, guys, well, I don't even know where to start. It was all doom and gloom over the last couple of weeks, but now we have more things to be cheerful of as we go into the next international break. Um, Dan and Mark, how are you feeling? What is your key takeout uh, from the week? That we are so back. <laughs> and I say that because I think the squad's making an impact. Obviously, the starting eleven is being effective at the moment given the results, but there's players coming off the bench and making an impact. Like Latte Lath coming off against uh, Cardiff, or oh, sorry, coming on against Cardiff and scoring. You've got against Sunderland, Morgan Rogers coming on, getting an assist. Sammy Silvera playing a big part in one of the goals. Marcus Force scoring one of the goals. Even Tommy Smith, you know, drafted in as a late replacement for Ralph Vandenberg, who got injured in the warm up. Him coming on and putting in an eye on faultless performance and basically pocketing Jack Clark. It's a squad game now, and the, the whole squad is making an impact. And dare I say, we have clicked. So just it's we're in a very good moment at the moment, aren't we? And I feel like we are back. Uh, Tom, how are you feeling? What's your key take up from the week? Uh, my key take out is I hate international breaks. I uh, just wish this could continue, to be honest. Um, and, you know, last month, the, the last international break, I was feeling the exact opposite. I couldn't wait for it. Um, but... You know we, we've done so well since uh, since turning the corner, really. Um, starting with that chef wed result, and then kind of like moving on. I mean, I think we hit rock bottom there, and then moved on. But yeah, this last week's been really, really good to to see. Um, I think it's it's finally clicked with us, and it's good to see us keep two clean sheets. I mean, obviously, it's good for the two wins, and especially the manner of yesterday as well. But the fact that we've been able to keep two clean sheets is a even more encouraging sign to me. Um, just because it, it does look like we've learned to be become a bit more solid now. And I think that's going to help so much for the rest of the season. Yeah, and I agree with you with both. I feel like the the Sheffield Wednesday result is just it actually just was rock bottom. Like you couldn't you couldn't have got any worse uh than than that uh, that first half especially. But I think the way that we've turned things around has been absolutely sublime. You know, I think that that result yesterday was so so good for me. You know, I think I think that first half I thought we just lacked a little bit of that cutting edge, but then it just seemed to click and sun unfolded and we were so so good in that second half but in just terms of my key takeouts progress is progress and we are doing a lot of good things now and hopefully it can continue i know there's going to be setbacks and winning every game is very unsustainable and you know if we don't win uh, two games in a row or we say if we don't win for like the next two games there's going to be turmoil once again uh but you know, I think right now we're in a really, really good moment going into the international break, and our performances have been absolutely superb um, for like, the for what we've done as well. Um, but there is two games to to chat about uh, this week, and we'll start off with Cardiff, and then we'll go into the fantastic game yesterday, uh, which I think everyone is here for. But Cardiff really did set this up quite nicely uh, for for yesterday's game. What was our thoughts on the performances, though? Because, you know, it kind of felt like a big game. Cardiff came to town and they're in a really good run of form. You know, they are the, the, one of the main form teams in the table. Fantastic defensively as well. And Millsborough, you know, ends up get, keeping a clean sheet and uh, scoring two wonderful goals. Uh, so, Tom, what was your uh, thoughts on the performance? 
Um, like I've just said there, I thought it was um, more solid defensively. Um, I, I know a lot of people will comment on the first half performance and kind of say, oh, I was two teams cancelling each other out. We weren't particularly at our best, but I did think it was kind of more of a, like a chess match between those two teams trying to figure each other out in, in the first half. Um, and I was I was more encouraged at the end of the first half, the fact that we you know hadn't conceded at that point. Uh, we did look defensively solid, and I'm thinking, you know, we can go on and get the clean sheet here, but also it looks like we've figured out how to defend, which has been our, our problem for, for quite a lot of this season. Um, then obviously you go into the second half, we get the goal, forces them to to really open up, and then obviously it leads to, to the last goal from from Latte Laugh, who uh, did give me a slight heart attack when he nearly fell over, but it ended up being... Uh, <laughs> Quite a, quite a good dummy to put the keeper off and just slot it in, but um, yeah, <laughs> overall I thought it was really good performance, and, and like I said, the most encouraging part of that for me was the clean sheet. Yeah, definitely. I think we we always have said with with Matt Carrick and when he since he's came over, uh, was it, since he took over, sorry, was that defensively we've always been a little bit suspect, but this kind of went back to the Chris Wilder era as well, and you know we were just outscore teams, so I was. The defense started to become more important this season. But Dana, what's your thoughts as well? Obviously, a big win. Uh, obviously, they were in the playoff places as well. So, obviously, it was a big win for us, wasn't it? It was. And I don't think Borough were great. I thought we were okay, and that was good enough. But I don't think the game was great in general anyway. And it was a match that was very important on patience because Cardiff, the way that they were set up, it was difficult for Borough to break them down. I think they, their game plan, switching between that 4-4-2 and 4-1-4-1 off the ball, really worked and, and helped them in that first half. I thought their number four, Gautas, I think, was very good defensively. And if it wasn't for him, I think we would have scored in that first half. So props to him for that. And props to Cardiff as well for basically managing Riley McGree because they were either cutting out the pass to him or as soon as he received the ball, I think their press against him was really good. They were on him quite quickly, marking him quite tightly once he'd received it. And so they obviously identified that McGree was a big influence on our game and they did well to negate that and to stifle that influence. But as soon as we got that first goal, it was basically how do they step on us and can we pick them off because of that? And in truth, in the end, I mean, we had uh, Crooks came on and immediately set Morgan Rogers through. And to be honest, we maybe could have scored more in that game, but it wasn't a classic necessarily. But it was it was one of those games where it gives you confidence because it's a different type of win. It was coming up against a really tough very well disciplined Cardiff side and we managed to break through. I know that the crowd maybe got on the players' backs at times in the first half, but it was just a game that required a lot of patience and fair play to put a massive credit to them because they stuck at it, they stuck at their game and they managed to break through and then we obviously got that second goal as well. So it was a, a really big win for us. Yeah, and we talk about like uh, confidence as well quite a lot on this podcast and how, how important it can be uh, for us, especially in the league. And, you know, you're gelling quite a few players together. And for me, like the win against Cardiff kind of symbolises that, you know, we actually are good enough to to really start to get up this league and start to really outperform things. And the more teams you be above you, the more confident you're going to get and kind of deserving of where you're going to be. You know, you've beat, we've beat two teams now who are sat in the playoff places uh, convincingly as well. And I think it's kind of one of those things where you can go, right, if we're beating these teams and we're having some good results around us, then why can't we get up this division and why can't we get into the playoff places and why can't we really challenge the teams above us? And it's a really good opportunity for us now to kind of reflect on in, in the international break and really go again for these next burst of games because it's going to come quick and fast. Um, but in terms of the Cardiff game, yeah, we just needed that patience. I think from side to side, uh, like breaking the team down, I would have liked to see uh, Lucas Angle a lot more in that first half. I know McNair kind of just seemed like he just wasn't wanting to pass to him. Um, but then when we did, he created opportunities and we we scored with, with one of his assists as well. So I want to talk about Lucas Angle as well because 
he had a very, very difficult start against, um, well, against Sheffield Wednesday. And, you know, he got hooked at half time. It was kind of like the, the end is nigh uh, for him. But he's <laughs> responded so, so well. Um, and he's making my five star rating come good. Because I just want to say, like yesterday, I know uh, before we scored that first goal, I thought that shot was rocket in top bins and it looked like Damn. it as well. Um, so I'm, if that went in, I would have been like, yeah, I was, I was right all along. Uh, we wouldn't but, have heard the end look, of it. Oh, you wouldn't know. This From would have been, anyway. Luke... oh, been called the Lucas Angle podcast. I would have had a Lucas Angle <laughs> face mask, a t shirt, like underpants. You know, it, it, would, it would have been obliged there. Yeah. to show my Matt Crooks cut out for the second podcast in a row. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I would have been eating Danish pastries and all sorts. Like, you, you bet I would have been uh, uh, getting there. But um, let's, let's chat about Lucas Angle then because <laughs> it was a big, big performance, wasn't it? And Tom. You know, at the first half, he wasn't really seeing much of the ball, but in the second half, he really showed his qualities, didn't he? Yeah, definitely. And uh, just to go back on the uh, the shot you mentioned there, a uh, lad at work jokingly called him the, the Danish Roberto Carlos after Tuesday. <laughs> if that had gone in, that name would have stuck. <laughs> like, we'd have yeah, been definitely. calling him that for ages. <laughs> but, um, no, I thought, I thought he played really well, um, especially second half against Cardiff. I thought first half... Yes, it, it did look like McNair just didn't want to pass to him at times. And I think the the crowd were audibly getting frustrated with that. There were some sort of kind of sarcastic cheers the first time he did pass it to Engel. Um, but I did think Engel was was solid that half without actually kind of doing too much going yeah. forward. Um, I, I did think at times the first half against Cardiff, he did look like he was lacking a little bit of confidence. Uh, in that I, th- I think the fans wanted to see him kind of take a player on or you know make a run down the left, but it would go to him and he'd play it patiently and play it back to McNair. Um, whether that was patience or if it was low confidence, because like let's say he, sometimes he would be facing up to his man and he just kind of turn and and play it backwards. But let's like say it was it was solid, safe first half, and then second half was where. It did seem like he kind of took the shackles off and he was like, right, I'm going to get forward. I'm going to try and attack this game, be more aggressive. And, you know, it's it, it ended up with him, um, ended up with an assist for for Jones's goal. And that must have been a world of good confidence wise. And I think he could see that yesterday as well. Also, I just want to kind of quickly shout out the amount of times that he was pretty much on his knees to chest the ball down on the, <laughs> yeah. on the touchline. I, I quite enjoyed seeing that. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's that's very like cop- we can copyright that. We can we can do something with that on this podcast as well. We can do something with that. Uh, Dana, what do you what do you think of Lucas Angle then? Now he's seen it. You know, he's had a couple of games in the in the side, and obviously his performance on Tuesday and probably yesterday were, were very very solid. Yeah, he was good on Tuesday, and it was a big character test for him because when you have a performance like he did against Sheffield Wednesday as a fan, you just want to see that improvement. You want to see that recovery. And that response, and we saw that on Tuesday, to be fair to him. In that second half, you could tell that assist gave him so much confidence. And that assist was quite fitting because it kind of embodies Lucas Engel, that he had that first attempted cross that wasn't successful, but then he comes back with a a successful one. Jones was offside, but we'll let it slide. He's actually scored two offside goals this week, which is fantastic. But um, I'm sure that'll come back to bite us at some point. But Lucas Engel's performance was definitely a big confidence booster for him. And it's good coming into that Sunderland game to know that you've got a left back there, especially with Lewis O'Brien's injury, that is growing and progressing. And there's still work for him to do. There's still progression to be to be had with him. But it's good that we have seen that recovery now from that Sheffield Wednesday game because he was very, very poor in that match. But if you're poor in a match, you just want to see a response the next game. And we saw that with Lucas Engel, so fair play to him. And it was really good from Carrick to bring him off and let the fans have that appreciation of him. Because when fans see that progression, they will show that appreciation of that. And it was good to see that little touch just to take him off and let the crowd applaud him off. It was good to see. Yeah. And I feel on the Sheffield Wednesday game, and I know he was poor, but I also think he was kind of a victim to the system as well, like a couple of the players were. And, you know, he got exposed quite bad, and it was a very brutal display, like just I think collectively in that first half. And he was unfortunately the symbol of that first half performance. But the second, the, the, you know, his, his appearance against Cardiff was for me excellent. You know, he was able to get down the line, he was in space all the time. 
And it was like, well, if we can utilize him for bringing these teams over that right hand side again and trying to, uh, well, lopside the player and try and get him in some space, he could be really dangerous. And I think we're trying to, the, the system that we're playing at the moment is really highlighting, I think, his strengths. And now we, we need to keep doing that as well because when Bangura will get his chance and come back in, he'll want to do the same things as, 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 as Engel. And I thought his ball in for, for Jones was fantastic. Um, his distribution of crossing, you know, it's going to get better and better. You know, it's not like going to be a, like a, a magic wand like Giles was last last year. Um, where, but to be honest, like he's shown real quality, and I think that give him time, let him keep progressing. I think collectively as Boroughs, we're a younger squad now than previous years. We're going to have these inconsistent moments. We are a championship team, which will also uh, show that as well. But I think he's going to start to slowly come good more and more. And maybe I overegged it with a five star plant. We all make mistakes, but I'm going to double down on it and just going to say, yeah, you know what? You'll do it for me. You'll be five star in my eyes, Lucas Engel. No matter what, I'm going to die on that sort. Um, but let's talk about another summer sign in the manual Latte laugh. Uh, because, you know, he ran through like Roadrunner uh, at the end uh, <laughs> to, to take uh, his, his second goal of the season and we've spoke about finishing with like a and he has a lot of positive attributes you know he's pressing quite, quite well his movement scored i thought he was good against sunland as well when he came on really try to hassle their defense when they were low on confidence so it's all the characteristics that you need but the finishing has always been a bit uh, but i kind of talk about this confidence thing as well but tom do you think that, like his goal was like a sign of it of, of what's potentially to come with like a laugh and what he can put what he can do for us i hope so uh because i mean that, that goal is incredible um there was a, a screenshot floating around twitter of how close the ball was to the cardiff defender and how far away like laugh was from it on tuesday night i mean in fairness the cardiff defender did have to turn to to run to it like laugh was already running he might have had a slight advantage there but even in real time at the match i was thinking He's not getting this. And then he goes and gets it anyway and like runs it through. And I would say the last time I kind of felt that like that about a player's pace in our team was Traore, which, you know, you'd watch him dribbling with it. Like, how has he kept hold of it? How is he keeping going and running through people? I'm not saying like they're last, as fast as, as Traore, but he's got that kind of electric pace that's going to get people off their seats and, and get them excited and, I just hope we see more of that. And I thought we saw good signs when he came off the bench yesterday as well. There was um, there was one point yesterday that I'm, I can still look back on and, and laugh at, which he cuts inside from the right-hand side. And I, I don't know which Sunderland defender it was tried to like muscle him off the ball. But he, he looked twice the size of him and just kind of like bounced off like they laugh before he <laughs> kind of went through and fired a left-footed shot over the bar. But, you know, that, that type of... Um, play you know he's good on the ball can can clearly hold it up I, I think it's only a matter of time until he's settled fully in the squad and then we'll we'll really sit, kind of see what he's all about yeah Dana have you got any other thoughts on on like a laugh like I know like see we'll we can talk more in depth on him in the future but have you got any like thoughts on all that you like you start to see more of him come off the bench and make an impact yeah he's a bit of a meme isn't he? Because he was almost too fast for his own good against Cardiff. And the goal was funny because he trips over his own feet. But then, to be fair to him, he has the composure to rebalance himself. And the finish is actually really good. So he makes me laugh. I think that's why I, I say that he's a bit of a meme. He's so quick, almost too quick for himself. But I completely echo what you have said that he causes chaos, he causes problems for defenders because he's quick, very quick. And his movement is fantastic as well. It's just, he needs refining. He just needs a little bit extra coaching just to refine the player that he is because there is a good player in there. Um, he just needs that consistency in front of goal, which I think he lacks a little bit. But yeah, I like a lot of what he brings. I also think it's quite ironic that you both said that he makes you laugh. Um, and it's like a laugh. It's, yeah. just, it's quite. I was just thinking, I was like, yeah. is this? Are you doing this on purpose? Is this like an inside <laughs> no. joke? It's like I've just came I in. Completely and missed like... it. To be fair. Um, See, I'm. I'm but... always thinking like the latter rather than the laugh of his name. Yeah. But whatever. Yeah. Well, on Sky Sports yesterday, they were saying it was lat, like a like a, a lat muscle. Not. I was like, it's it's not that. It's like a laugh. We all know that. Uh, and just and just for me as well. I mean, yeah, he definitely needs refining. But the things that excite me, and I know yesterday was kind of like a. 
Sonnen were dead and buried, really, uh, when he came on. But his, his real hunger to kind of make proof a point and try to try and get on the score sheet himself and, you know, influence the game by letting, uh, with, with far scoring, unlucky with his left-footed shot as well. And he just, for me, is looking like this more solid signing the more I'm seeing him. And he's just looking sharper and sharper. And it's quite similar with uh, another players of this team, that the more confident we're getting, the, the better we're actually looking. And you can see the quality starting to uh, hopefully shine through. And, you know, it's going to be a... It's, it's very much a long game, I think, with Middlesbrough at the moment. But right now, it's a very good moment for us to be in. And Latter Laugh, I think, was was really good. And I would maybe like to see him when we come back, you know, from the international break. I know Colburn's done well and it might be a bit harsh for him to go back on the bench. But I think Latter Laugh could maybe bring us something a little bit different as well going forward. Um, but before we move on to Sunderland, I just want to quickly uh, move on and say the FCA's voting is very, very close to short. And it's actually going to be short. If you listen to us on Monday, it's too late. But if you listen to us on Sunday, you have the opportunity to vote for us uh, right now. Um, you can go to uh, www.footballcontentawards.com forward slash voting. Um, you can go to the drop down menu, best podcast. Uh, we are in the football league category. It's like board breakdown, scroll down, uh, click the terms and conditions and vote for us. Um, every vote counts and it'd be fantastic if we would come home uh, with the trophy. You know, got nominated last year. We we're very unlucky uh, not to to get the, get the old uh, trophy. But this year, you never know. With your votes, we could do it. And that'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? But... Let's forget about that now and let's talk about the Sunderland game because Middlesbrough had their biggest win at the stadium of light against Sunderland. Uh, Greenwood, Crooks, Jones and Marcus Voss um, sealed the win for Borough. Um, it's only 4-0. And it was because of the referee, really. Um, so it's the, it was all the referee's fault. Um, but Tom Green, how are you feeling about that 4-0 win over Sunderland? Because I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume that you're actually absolutely buzzing. Oh, I am. I'm feeling absolutely fantastic after that. It's uh, so nice to see. Um, you know, I, I put something on my Twitter afterwards saying it's it's really nice to kind of see Karma coming around to bite Sunderland after after last year and the the Ross Stewart Tom Daly impression and stuff like that. And it's yeah, it's it's great. Um, I, I think it's me and Dana were talking just before the podcast, and we were both kind of in agreement that the irony is fantastic of what the Sunderland fans are. Are going through at the moment where like, oh, the referees influence the the outcome of the game and stuff like that, and we're like, yeah, that was exactly what happened last year with us, though. So zero sympathy. Um, but I mean, <laughs> good performance anyway. Um, I, I thought first half it was quite even. Being totally honest, I was looking forward to half time because um, I, w- I was thinking Sunderland did have more of the ball towards the second half of that first half. Even though I didn't think they looked like creating much other than um, when Clark and Roberts were running directly at our defence, which looked to be like when they were more dangerous. But I, I was confused as to why they had those offensive weapons, but then they were trying to resort to crossing for most of the first half, which was getting cut out by Dale Fry most of the time. Um, and then obviously the red card comes right before half-time. That's, that's got to change things. But it, it looked like... Sunderland came out second half and their heads had gone. Um, you know, Crooks had that one saved by Patterson, and you thought then it's only a matter of time till we score, and then we just went on to absolutely annihilate them. Just what a brilliant feeling for a, for a Sunday morning and, and all of Saturday as well. <laughs> Dana, just let us know what you're feeling as well, because I'm you. I'm, I'm assuming you're going to echo all of this, right? Yeah, well, to quote Sam Greenwood... Yeah, I feel unbelievable. Um, had a right little buzz on. <laughs> you had a right, right little buzz on. What a quote that was, by the way. Yeah, it was everything that you wanted from a Tears We Are Derby as a Borough fan, isn't it? And in fairness, it wasn't what I was expecting. I thought it would be tougher than that for us. Even 11 v 11, I thought Borough shaded it in the first half. Obviously, they probably had the latter half of the first half being the better side. But all in all, in that first half, I thought we just about were the the better side of the two. They obviously caused us problems through dribbling, and that's maybe an area that we need to improve upon. But, I mean, we absolutely picked them off in that second half, and it was a masterclass in efficiency and, and clinical finishing, and it was brilliant to watch. It honestly was. They completely underestimated us before the game. Some of the comments from Sunderland fans were crazy. 
I know that we've had a poor start to the season, but we are by no means a crap side. Yeah, we've had crap moments this season. And at times I've thought maybe we are a crap side, but we've definitely worked ourselves into a much better moment. And we went into this game with momentum. And even that, they were completely disregarding that. So we have served them up a massive slice of humble pie there, I think. And it's brilliant that we can just soak in those Macam tears because it was brilliant to see them just clearing out the stadium of like 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 that Tesco's clearance aisle. It was absolutely <laughs> stupendous. And I loved every minute of it. Yeah, and just want to say that they are other shops out there um than just Tesco's yeah. clearance aisle. <laughs> um, but <laughs> the, yeah, I I can't I couldn't believe it when we when in that second half it was very much a click we put on a clinic really it was just like mm. see you later and i was very shocked at how bad some of them were in that second half very much just gave in and it was strange for me and, and we all know it's hard to play against 10 men and um you know they just kind of fell apart and I'd be very worried if I'm not very worried, but I'd be concerned if I was a Sunderland fan after that performance. I think once you take one player out of that team and to see that change and the tactical change, I think Mowbray made to go to five at the back and then move to a flat four in the second half, I think was maybe the wrong decision. Uh, but it could be a, a squad building thing as well. But that first half, I thought we edged it in terms of uh, possession base. We controlled the game in, in key moments. I thought it was, we, we just weren't good with our end product in that. And it was always the final ball that kind of that didn't give us the opportunities that we needed. And as the game got a little bit chaotic, that's where Sunderland thrive. I think if you ever are to play Sunderland, if you can dominate the play and try to nullify certain moments or try and press them and get the, as soon as it's try to limit the, the the ball into Clark or ball into Roberts, then I kind of just think, well, that's kind of job done, really. I'm not, I'm not, it, sounds a bit, it sounds a bit harsh for Sunderland, but... I think that they need to keep building and need some experience in that side. And we'll come on to them a little bit later on what we think of our actual thoughts. But the overall performance for me, brilliant. Absolutely second half. It was a clinic and I was absolutely delighted at uh, full time when we uh, we fought 4-0. And to see all the, the tweets and all the reaction was just amazing to see. Uh, but Dana, what was your overall assessment on the actual performance itself? I know it was like kind of like a, a tale of two halves, but an overall assessment, what do you think it was like for Borough? I don't really think it was a tell of two halves, to be honest, because I, as I said, I thought that we were the better side. It, it was close to being even in that first half, but I think we just about edged it because we control the game, as you said, you spot on there. Borough not allowing the game to get chaotic was so important because as soon as you allow the game to open up like that and you don't retain possession and you give them the ball they're going to get it to Clark they're going to get it to Roberts and they're going to dribble at us and at points towards the end of the half I think we did allow that a little bit obviously the save that Dieng made shout out to him because I honestly thought that was it as soon as he got through into the box and Engel had a snap at him um, I think Hackley tried to have a bite at him and he just weaved his way through. I thought that's a certain goal. And actually, he saved big from Carl and Grant against Cardiff as well at nil nil. So, two massive, massive saves from Sally Dieng at nil nil in both of our games this week. I thought in that second half, obviously, the, the red card definitely impacted it, but it was honestly. In that first half, anyway, we were getting a lot of joy from central areas because Bellingham and Neil, as good as they are, individually at times obviously very raw still uh, with Bellingham in particular they were letting up a lot of space in behind them and I think Borough had a lot of joy advancing into those central areas and a lot of our moves were started from there and I think that Hackney and Barlasa did have a, a lot of joy in those central roles and then we switched it in that second half getting the ball out wide circulating it to Jones and just let him do his thing. He had them on absolute smoke and it was brilliant to watch the Isaiah Jones of all come back and yeah, just absolutely brilliant in that second half. Incredibly clinical and we deserved it. We absolutely deserved it because we played our game. We played our game rather than the occasion, you know, it being a derby. 
And as much as they want to protest that it isn't a derby, Daniel lost his head. So maybe he did give in to the fact that it's a little bit of a derby, Sunderland fans. So it was brilliant. We controlled the game excellently. And I think that's probably the best part of the game, that we managed to just manage the uh, manage our game, just play the way that we play and don't you know block out everything else. And I thought it was superb from Borough. Massive credit to the players and, for Carrick, uh, and Carrick for for that. Yeah. And I think just two players I want to highlight there where you were saying that, that I think one, Dan Barlasser, very, very good yesterday and very good on Tuesday and very, very good against Bradford as well. And he's just, yeah. what he's always in space. He's always able to find the right pass. And we looked very, very comfortable with the system that we're playing. Now he seems a bit more protected than he had been in, in the previous game. The second one, Senny Dieng and Tom, since you are my resident five-a-side goalkeeper, um, <laughs> I just thought it'd be worth mentioning here. A lot was said and like, a lot has been said on like on social media now around like Dieng, Stefan, comparisons. Just I kind of want to hear your thoughts on Senny Dieng right now because he's obviously made those two big uh, big saves during the week and he's looking really more, he's looking comfortable. So where's your thoughts on Senny Dieng at the moment? What, what are you thinking? <laughs> I think I think it was Matt, our our designer, who's put it on Twitter saying he might actually be an upgrade on Stefan. And I do agree with that. Um I would be honest, before we signed him, I didn't know that much about his distribution um and, and what type of keeper he was in that respect. Um I remember him playing against Borough and you know making some decent saves when he did. Uh, I think didn't he get sent off and then Joe Lumley came on and had a absolute masterclass as well. Um, yeah, I, I remember those those bits, but I, I didn't really know what type type of keeper he was. But I was saying this to my uncle yesterday when we were watching the game. I think I feel a lot safer on corners and crosses with Dieng in goal than I ever did with Stefan in goal. Um, from a distribution standpoint, I would say both similar, although throwing uh, Dieng would be better. But we just haven't seen it a lot. But we know what he's he's got in the in the bank for his throwing. But um, yeah, I, I think in terms of coming out and closing one on ones, like he does, him and Stefan both similarly good in that respect. Um, but I, I just think his, his command of the area is a lot better. And like I say, I feel a lot safer with him in goal. And that that save yesterday, that was a pure seven aside save. That just getting down low <laughs> with your foot and tipping that round. That was. So good to see because I, I was like, then I thought that was in as soon as Patrick Roberts got in, put on his left foot like that. I was like, it's just it's the same position he scored for us against against um Redden in the COVID season, and pretty much ensured we'd, we'd stayed up. I was expecting that to go in the bottom corner. So for Stefan to just kind of get get down that quickly and save it with his boot like that, just fantastic save. Yeah, it really was, wasn't it? I think. If I could describe uh, Saiyan Dieng in, in, a, in a characteristic, I'd probably say it's his hairline. Uh, amazing what? hairline and amazing performances lately. So shout out to Saiyan Dieng as well. And there was obviously a key moment oh, in the, the game. Hairline. I think when... Oh, no, it's, it's a great hairline. Now, now, you look, now I've pointed it out to every fan. Every, every fan will go, yeah, it does have a decent hairline. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> There was a big moment in the game yesterday, and obviously everyone, well, a lot of the Sunday fans are talking about it as well. And there was a Daniel red card; it came from descent, and obviously second uh, yellow. Influential moments can, like you know, the game state really how can a game change was right on the stroke of half time. Uh, how much influence did you think it had, Dana? Like, was it like a obviously it, it Middlesbrough scored four in the second half, but? the influence of that red card, where the game was and where it went to, how big of a change do you think it, it impacted things, really? Well, yeah, it was a, a big change. I think it'd be daft to argue otherwise because it opened up the space that Isaiah Jones then exploited in the second half because they had a, a man disadvantage. But the thing is with that red card, everyone knows the rules. Everyone was made abundantly clear in regards to the rules before a ball was even kicked this season, that they were clamping down on descent and time wasting. And the thing is with that, obviously Coburn's trying to tussle for possession with one of the Sunderland defenders and it goes out for a Sunderland goal kick. Why is he asked? Like, mm. why is he why is he talking to the referee and arguing with him? It's a goal kick. Like, fair enough, if it's a Middlesbrough corner, just shut your mouth. But I'm glad that he didn't because he got him sent off. But I don't understand. I mean, the first yellow card anyway, 
he's very, very lucky that he doesn't make contact with Corbin's shin because if he does, that's a straight red for dangerous player. So the rules are the rules. Them's the rules. And you got to go, Dan Neil. So see you later. <laughs> that, was, that was very aggressive. Um, that was very... Well, he's a Mac, I don't wow. give a fuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I, just, I was just shocked by that point. Did I? Uh, I was very <laughs> shocked. Yeah, but I, I think the red card in itself... Tom, he could have been sent off earlier. Dennis said, dangerous player. Do you have a point? Is there a point? Do you think he could have been sent off at that at that point as well, what, 20 minutes before? I agree with what Dennis said. I think if he'd have made contact with either of Corbin Shins, he would have been off. Um, I thought that as soon as it happened while I was watching it on TV, I mute my phone and put it on Do Not Disturb while the football is on so I don't go on Twitter. I went on after, after he'd been sent off just to kind of make make out what, what everyone was saying about it and I didn't realise that that had kind of been that much of a focal point on Twitter for the 20 minutes after it had happened as well I thought you know I, I, after, after that that initial tackle I was like he's lucky he went through his legs yellow card um, and, and that was be it but I didn't know it was that much of a talking point but yeah if he'd have made contact with either one of Corburn's legs there that was a straight red because his studs were up it was reckless he was like uncontrolled um so it was a deserved yellow card um but like i say if he did actually made contact that was a red yeah um just for me i actually thought that first challenge was a red card to be honest i i I think he has no control of his challenge there the way that his foot's going up and up and up i was thinking oh god this could be a leg breaker and I just thought that was a red card straight away um i thought he was very very lucky to to stay on the pitch from that but then you can't like games like like I appreciate it. it's an emotional game. It's a full stadium. Uh, it's tense. You know both teams were showing good moments, but to show dissent for a goal kick is just so stupid. Like game yeah, management. Like exactly. come on. Um, but he should have been sent off earlier on, and I don't think anyone would have complained if he did go. To be honest, I think if anything, they'd been like, oh well, it could be a little bit harsh, but no, his foot was up. Like. I think he was very, very lucky that he wasn't sent off in that moment. And obviously, you go down to 10 men. Half time, you've got, if you're going to have a red card, you have it at half time because you've got 15 minutes to sort out what you want to do, how you want to set up a team. And well, obviously, 95th minute red card's fine. But like half time in that moment, you've got enough time as a management team and as players to kind of regroup, change your system. And they did make a change, of course, at half time. And just go again and make it difficult, but they absolutely folded, and we went ahead with a very, very good goal uh, from Sam Greenwood. And you know it had to be him, didn't it? You know, former Macam going to the Stadium of Light and and scoring a, a very, very good finish. Dana, uh, it was lovely how he opened his body up, put it in the top corner. But let's maybe maybe watch it back you know maybe like let's talk about it a bit more because it was a lovely finish good play from Bora as well it was yeah and I mean it starts from Isaiah Jones very positive player down the right hand side he wins as a corner and I think Sunderland are expecting Dan Barras in that little half space there to whip the ball into the box but instead he plays the ball to the edge of the box to Lucas Engel because obviously all of the Sunderland players have converged into the central uh, well into the box essentially so Engel has a lot of space and I think he has the right idea shooting obviously it gets blocked I did think that that was going into the top corner or something that we were about to have some sort of insane like Emerson's type strike but then Dill Fry gets the ball and and obviously Fry being a centre half you might have thought okay he's going to recycle possession he's going to pass back to Engel and then we might get the box sorry the ball into the box from there but he, he kind of becomes playmaker and he drops the shoulder he deceives the Sunderland player and then if you watch Sam Greenwood throughout the entirety of this move he is not picked up for a good five or six seconds and he manages to come from the right to the left hand side he makes a really good near post run um, as the cross comes in he's still not being picked up makes that run to the near post and the finish is actually really really good because he uses the pace of the cross from Dale Fry I mean can we just talk about Dale Fry being on the left wing and putting in that ball for a second because I, I <laughs> that would not have been on my things to expect from the game it was a fantastic cross in fairness to him but Greenwood uses the pace of it wraps his foot around it 
straight into the the roof of the net past Anthony Patterson it was absolutely brilliant finish and I mean narrative or what out of all the players that were going to score that game it just felt like it was destined to be Sam Greenwood right I think he said after the game that it you know was his dream to play at the stadium light or whatever and now he scored past them I mean a conflict of emotions there but obviously as Borough fans we were all just buzzing and we completely picked them off from there it was a fantastic goal and he looks good Greenwood I will say he looks good and that was a good finish yeah, I was going to say we've seen more of Sam Greenwood now, two starts in a row. Have your thoughts changed, Dana, on since the, the lowdown video? I know we said that in, that in that video that how we manage him is really key and you know how we utilise him as well is going to be a big focal point. We've started to see him more now, you know, from that from that 10 position, really, and also on the left-hand side. What's your thoughts? Has it changed? To be honest, I can't even remember what I said in my lockdown. I remember what you said, that he's got potential, can we unlock it? I think he is a natural finisher from, I mean, he's both footed. And I, I absolutely love that in a football. I think that's a fantastic quality to have because imagine the situations that you find yourself in as a striker in the box or, sorry, an attacking player in the box. You don't need to have to shift it onto your favoured foot because there simply isn't one. You know, it, it, being ambidextrous like that, I think it's it's fantastic to have a player like that. Cameron Archer, I think, was very similar. So I quite like him. I think he's shown really good flashes that I want to see more of against Cardiff. I thought he was bright, probably the best player on the pitch. In all honesty, I will uh, reiterate: I don't think anyone was particularly great because the performance in itself the game in itself wasn't great I think as I can only really say as much as good which is fine I, I don't want to go too extreme either way but I have quite liked the look of Sam Greenwood I think he's got something about him where his finishing is good I think his ability with the ball and the play in terms of probably just understanding the space and understanding his teammates around him too I think I actually quite like him. I'd like to see more of him, either on the left or through the middle. I think he's a very good player to have, and I was impressed with him against, well, Cardiff and Sunderland, to be fair. Tom, what's your thoughts as well? Um, you know, you've, you've seen more of him now, you're getting a, a good understanding of what type of player he is. So what type of player do you think he is now, and what's your thoughts on him just in general? Do you think What do you think he influences? I, th- I think he is good in those attacking midfield positions. I don't want to kind of say too much and big him up too much after after two games. Um, it's not really a good sample size to kind of build a, an opinion of him from. But like Dana said, I think the the fact that he's ambidextrous and you know both footed on on a football pitch is is really going to help. Uh, he does seem you know quick in terms of his decision making to to pass a ball off. He's got that bit of creativity. What I would like to to just see a little bit more of, and I, I don't want to be unfair to him here because he's had a, a good game yesterday, but there were times where he was in the box, and I think it just it slowed slowed down a little bit, kind of looking for the perfect angle for the shot. And by the time that had happened, um, you know, uh, Sunderland centre back had kind of closed off the the route anyway. So, like. Because I, I think we can see he's got the ability, he's got the the quick feet to be able to kind of, you know, have a shot from there or at least try and beat the man. Just just do that um, and, and you know, try and speed things up there. But overall, I thought he's he's been really good and positive for, for the last couple of games. Um, and what I, what I really like now, going into the international break, is there's a bit of a selection headache for when we come back. Um, I think he's, he's definitely part of us. You know, we've got him... Who plays out with him and McGree? Crooks doesn't deserve to be dropped. So, uh, you know, does does he keep his uh, space in the team? Rogers is looking positive when he's coming on, and they got Laugh and Corburn up front, kind of battling it out. So, it's he, he's part of a very good uh, problem for for Carrick to have coming back after international break. Yeah, it's competition for places, Don, and I absolutely <laughs> love it. But I feel like there's a player who. Probably is the first name on the team sheet at the minute, and it's Isaiah Jones. And last year, you know, he went through a very difficult patch, and obviously, off the pitch stuff really did influence what we'd seen on it. But Tom, are we starting to see the the best out of Isaiah Jones now? Him back to his best because he was absolutely electric yesterday, wasn't he? So I wouldn't even say back to his best because for me, and I don't know if this is recency bias, yesterday was the best game I've seen him for Borough. I've 
you know, the ball stuck to his foot every time he was going past a player. Um, I, I don't think I actually saw him fail to take someone on. Um, his decision making was quality. He's put in some really decent balls, created some good chances, and yeah, I, I think he's he's not only back to his best. I think he's surpassing what we've seen a couple of years ago uh, under Wilder, where he was in the the right wing back position and and you know, doing outstandingly well there. Um, and it's it's great to see for him. Dana, what's the, what do you think? We're better yeah. than, is that was that his best performance? I, I definitely think it's up there. Obviously, you do need to factor in the the man disadvantage of Sunderland. But to be fair to Jones, his final ball has improved massively. Like some of the deliveries that he was putting into the box yesterday in that little corridor between the goalkeeper and the defensive line, they were fantastic. And it is an absolute joy to see Jones playing like this because he's such a fun player to watch when he gets into the groove. And that second goal that we scored is exactly the type of goal that I love to see from us. Getting Isaiah Jones to the byline, cutting it back and having Crooks where Crooks loves to be in the right areas to score. And I'm really happy for Jones. I am. I'm really happy because, we, you know, I have come on here and criticised his technique and his crossing, but he's improved that. That's all we want to see as, as fans. We want to see improvement of players. And I'm absolutely delighted for him that he's back to, you know, probably back to his best. And he was excellent yesterday. First time scoring and assisting in the same league game. Um, and now he scored in successive games for the first time. Six shot creating actions yesterday, three goal creating actions. Obviously, the goal he scored, the assist, and then I think the third one would count as the corner that ended up in the attack towards Borough's um, first goal. So brilliant, absolutely brilliant from Johns. Absolutely smoked Jack Clark, left him on the pitch for the. Uh, second goal was it absolutely brilliant from him and uh, a deserved man of the match award after the game yeah I agree and what I loved yesterday was the celebrations and not just his celebration but the whole team celebration um, but let me take you to a place where membership is a smiling <laughs> so I can't even say it <laughs> um, look let's just go to the place where everyone and the, who, everyone who listens to this podcast absolutely loves it is Shithouse Island let's go there let me take you to a place where membership's a smiling face Pushing shoulders with the stars Where strangers take you by the hand And welcome you to Wonderland From beneath the Panama Shit house island drinks are free Fun and sunshine There's enough for everyone All that's missing is the sea But don't worry You're a shit house I have ruined Club Tropicana for any one <laughs> fan for, <laughs> who listens to this podcast. Uh, shit house island, drinks are free. Lovely shit house moments yesterday from Bora. Couple of celebrations, but let's break them down, Dana, uh, Tom, because there was some clear moments. You know, Dana, do you want to take it away on this one? Do, what, what do you think? There was a lovely Shearer celebration from Crooks. I mean, I hate Newcastle, but good shit house yeah. Yeah, I mean, the the first one, to be fair, as much as Sam Greenwood doesn't celebrate, how could he celebrate for him, doesn't he? A couple of his ears to the Sunderland fans. You could tell he was gagging to do that as he was running towards that corner. Then Jones as well, because I think they they were booing Jones, actually, in the build-up to that, because he had a contentious, like, he, he, I think it was a foul. Look, or nine on Jones, it wasn't given. They thought he dived, they were booing him. Then he just delivers that ball into the box, gives them turns around, gives them the shush, and then yeah, the Shearer <laughs> Crooksy God. It, I hate Newcastle and I also hate Alan Shearer, but to be fair, if you are trying to rattle the Sunderland fans, that's what you do, don't you? And it was excellent shithousery. We are back. We are back. It's been a long time coming, Shithouse Highland. We've had to maybe dust off some cobwebs on those trees, but we are firmly back in business. So thank you for that, Crooks yeah. Hackney. And Jones. It was funny actually seeing um Tommy Smith play like the role of the unamused uncle, but he was just trying to like 
you know, rein it in because I think Jones was on a yellow card, wasn't he? So good, good game management, to be fair, from Tommy Smith. Yeah, and Tom, I'll bring it back up for you. The uh, the the the, the shit house moments, if you will, uh, let you get your thoughts on it as well, because there's some really good things there, isn't there? Like, what What do you think? What were your What were your key shit house moments for you? See, for me, it's it's a couple that haven't really been mentioned kind of too much yet. Hackney was clearly having the time of his life during that game yesterday. <laughs> o- other than putting in an absolutely unreal performance, every time we scored, he was going over and giving it to the Sunderland fans. Dill Fry in the background, I hadn't noticed until I've just watched that back there, but he was doing the same. You can tell us Borough lads, they were absolutely loving it yesterday. Um, <laughs> and then lastly, I don't think we've put him on Shethouse Island, but I still feel like he deserves a mention. Marcus Force for the fourth goal with his little celebration mm. afterwards. <laughs> just <laughs> everything about yesterday. It just, it seemed like um, the the actual Borough players were in a very similar situation to us fans. Haven't really forgotten the uh, what happened last season and just kind of went out the way to, to celebrate every <laughs> goal uh, in front of the Sunderland fans. It was, uh, it was beautiful to see. Yeah, and look, Marcus Force isn't on there, you know? So... Mm. Do we think he is deserving to to join uh, the islands? You know, the co- there's some spare coconuts knocking about. You know, since we haven't been for a while, uh, so you could definitely have something uh, to to play with. But uh, what do you think? Do we do we think he's deserving of it, Tom? I'm assuming you're all for Shithousery. I yeah. personally enjoyed it. I think it's just it's just it's just quite funny. Uh, it's just, it's like <laughs> not even like Shithousery. It's just funny. Um, so then. I mean, it's two to one here, so I don't think you really have a choice. Uh, but I, I mean, think? I made the graphics, so I kind of do have a choice. I think we wait for Marcus Voss. I think there's something else up his sleeve because I don't know if that was a, to the Sunderland fans or he was just doing it because everyone calls him Moody Git. I don't know, but I like that. Yeah, that that was a good celebration. To be fair, we got to meme that. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. When it's palm off a tea, uh, <laughs> uh, but may- maybe okay. Well, I'll play a bit devil's advocate, and, and since you made the graphic, you can have a bit more weight to it. <laughs> Me and Tom think it is shit housery. We'll bring it to the viewers and listeners. You know, we'll put a, we'll put a poll out maybe today or on Monday morning, and we'll say is this a class of shit housery? Um, and we'll let the fans vote, you know. Is it worthy enough? You know, the, the, the stakes are getting higher. The, there's players that are really desperate to get on there. I think, the, you know, I think the... the I don't want to say too much here, but I think Mike Carrick said, look, guys, shout out Irons not being done in a while. And we all know... <laughs> we, we, we all know you listen. So do your bit, guys, and get yourself on the island and enjoy your, enjoy your break because drinks are free. But no, it's obviously five in a row. We're going to... Sail away from Shadow Island right now, and Mills have won five in a row in all competitions. Unbeaten in six, it really should have been six wins in a row, really, to be honest. If I want to nitpick the draw against Sheffield Wednesday, but don't you think there's still improvements to be made in this time, this side? Because with, there's still a long way to go in this season, and you know, we still show glimpses of inconsistency, uh, even though we're in a really good moment. So, where do you think the improvements need to be made? I still think we could be a little bit more aggressive off the ball and maybe engage uh, in the opponent a little bit more. I also think that I, we saw this in the first half in both games this week, actually, just circulating the ball out to Lucas Engel a lot quicker. I think sometimes we're a little bit too slow to get the ball out to him. There were a few times in that first half against Sunderland where he was free and we were just maybe one or two seconds off and then the pass wasn't as potentially fruitful as it would have been had we played that first time. So could maybe pass the ball to to that left-hand side a little bit quicker because sometimes our out ball is there and we don't really identify it. Or we do identify it, we just don't pass there. We saw it against Card, we saw it against Sunderland a little bit in the first half and then uh, Lee Hendry on commentary made a, made a note of that. I also think individual performances could be a little bit better. I'm not going to nitpick, but there are still improvements to be made. Um, just an example, like Paddy McNair, a lot of the time, instead of putting the ball down the line, he hikes it straight out of play. Like if you're under pressure, just put that ball into the channel. Don't put it out of play because it gives the opposition that potential advantage. Obviously, it gives them the ball back immediately from from a throw in. Whereas if you punt it down the channel, you never know if you've got Latter Lath in the team, could potentially get onto the end of that. I think there's maybe improvements to be made on Hayden Hackney's defending. Um 
and maybe spotting the runs that are made by Latilath when he comes on as well. So there's there's obvious improvements to be made, but we are growing, we're progressing, and we're going to get better. We're going to see sometimes that we might have some things to plug, but we are in a good moment at the moment, and hopefully we could keep it going. It's not to say that we're anywhere near the finished article because we are not. We're going to have inconsistencies. We've just got to iron those out and build the momentum. Yeah, okay, and, and obviously with that as well, you know, we're going to have defeats, we're going to have really good performances, which, you know, don't get the results that we want. But I was going to ask you your thoughts on Sunderland for the Perriers, but I feel like I can't be bothered to because I'm just going to say there are <laughs> a bunch of dribbly, there are a bunch of dribbly <laughs> boys who just a bunch of flair players and they'll be 15th by Christmas. That's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, Tom, what, I, got, I was going to say, Tom, do you have any thoughts actual, on Sunderland in general before we move on to something quite Ooh, wonderful? I mean... On Sunderland in general, I'm going to have to be careful, otherwise I'll end up with more crying Mackhams and my Twitter mentions and my mate Ash <laughs> replying to him after 11 hours on the drink in Portugal. But um, <laughs> try, <laughs> trying to uh, trying to give him as fair an analysis as possible. Just going back to what I said earlier, why are they crossing the ball so much? Like their two best <laughs> offensive weapons are Clark and Roberts. I think that was shown yesterday when Roberts ran at our defence and you know Clark was caused those problems on the other side, but then they'll try and cross it to straight to a centre back who's bigger than uh you know Burstow who was playing up front. So I, I don't he was understand. Shy him. Yeah, I, I I don't understand what their actual plan was as a team yesterday. Um someone on I think it was Sky Sports said um we're, we're covering the last game like oh Stuart and Diallo scored the goals um last time. Might have been BBC says they were talking about that, and I was like, "Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how they get on without those two players, and you know, without Stewart diving five yards over a, a penalty box." But um, <laughs> yeah, it, it did. It it really looked like they were missing them yesterday. It looked like the two best parts of their team had been taken out, and what was left was Clarks and Roberts who can make things happen on their own. But in in terms of like a complete team. It didn't look that impressive. On that as well, just on our side of things, we obviously didn't have Ronnie McGree on that side, nor did we have Housen, and we didn't miss them. So it, it, it just goes to show that this squad is stepping up now, and uh, not just the, the starting 11, but the whole squad. Yeah, and obviously Rav Vandenberg got injured in the warm as well. I thought like when it rains, it pours. And but the 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 sun came out and we had a well, it didn't really. The sun came out for Bora <laughs> and we won four 0 So that was fantastic. And just as we we round off Sunderland now, then you've had a look at the forums in uh, well the Sunderland forums uh, as you will uh, before the game. So take it away. I feel it's be quite nice for you, uh, for Bora fans to have a quick look at. Yeah, are we ready? Because there's some corkers in here. Go for it. We start off with, I must be the only person that thinks we're going to hammer them tomorrow. That's my favourite. Actually, no, it's not, because there's more. There's shite this season. See their game home at Cardiff. Awful. Their defence is shot as shite. No spine and live up front. If it ended in a draw, I'd be suicidal. And then this is my favourite one. He goes, 4 nil to us. Bookmark this. I bookmark that. Well, that's lovely. Um, really lovely stuff. I mean, do we, do we put Dana on shit house island? <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually thought we got someone from Sunderland on the podcast for a minute there, and I was like, I was like, but I like, I love, I love the change of of tone and accent halfway through that. I was just like, ah, you know, I'm gonna go full shit housery for that. Um, so I mean, fantastic, I guess. But I love how we we can bookmark that uh, final uh, forum uh, message That's forever. That's the best one. We'll put it in the Louvre, and uh, we'll we'll enjoy every moment of it. But I just want to quickly mention a quick tweet from the week as well. <laughs> from Chris uh, Borough, uh, UTB and it was just a lovely uh, analysis on uh, Michael Carrick's dress wear and you know he said about like, the grey jumper the track suit, the black jumper, black t-shirt black jacket and it's an amazing analysis and if you can find it on Twitter please do because it is really really good and Michael Carrick wore the grey jumper yesterday and Borough have only won one game out of the five with the grey jumper so the injuries and Michael Carrick wearing a great jumper. I thought, oh God, we're in for a rough ride here. Um, but in terms of expected knitwear, we absolutely shot up yesterday because we ended up winning uh, quite convincingly. And the analysis is brilliant. We're unbeaten in the tracksuit, which I thought was really cool. Uh, we're unbeaten, of course, in the black t-shirt and the black jacket. And 
You know, it's uh, the black jumper, of course. We've had two 1-1 one, one, lost ones, so that's up for debate. But, you know, I thought it was just really, really good. And uh, I just wanted to give it a little shout-out this week because I thought it was really cool. Great jumper. Up the grey jumper, you know. Yeah, everyone loves a grey jumper, and keep it up, Michael. You know, maybe we should start to have something on this podcast. I remember bring Chris on one time, and we just we dissect uh, what fashion statements uh, Craig should do. You know, maybe we should have a trilby one week, wear a hat trilby, and just uh, go from like there. We'll get this dressed is up. Discussion as, like... we podcast for. This is what makes this podcast. Yeah, you know, like I, I could, I could see Jonathan would get a knitted vest. You know what I mean? Like, why, why can't we just like bring some? Do really you think Jonathan cool would get would wear a turtleneck? I know Daryl Lenahan would wear a yeah. turtleneck. Yeah, I reckon. I, I reckon. You think, uh, think Woodgate would? Would you wear? Mm, yeah, Woodgate would. Yeah, I, I, I think. Yeah, I, I think it. Woodgate would go Stone Island jumper, just like Pep. <laughs> mm. yeah. What about a Stone a Island jump. turtleneck? Hmm. Yeah, could do. I think I, I do think that Aaron Danks saw. He's just uh, I'm I'm just a jeans and hoodie guys. You know what I mean? No, I'm he's just, not I, jeans. I he wears shorts all the time. Him, doesn't he? It's like yeah, freezing cold but... in December, and he's still wearing shorts. <laughs> yeah, but you can wear shorts in the in the bongo, can you? Actually, no, you can. Um, so <laughs> no, in the bongo. <laughs> in the bongo. So I mean, yeah, he's gonna. Yeah, well, you know, fashion statements and fashion of, of our coach staff and players, it should be it should be analysed. And shout out to Chris for doing that, by the way, because it's outstanding stuff. Maybe we just do it for all the players as well. It could be funny. But let's move on. Let's, uh, let's do podcast questions now. Podcast questions. Uh, each week, you get the chance to send us your podcast questions uh, via Twitter, Boring Score Breakdown, email the breakdown at hotmail.com, or by joining our Telegram chat with 360 Bora fans in there chatting everything about Bora. Well, yesterday it was a lot about Bora and all laughing at the Mackhams. Uh, we've got two questions this week. One's from Robbo, and he says, In your opinion, uh, what's been the reason behind Engel's notable improvement in the last two games? I will take this one since I'm the resident Engel fan. And I will say that the system, the system has improved uh, Engel quite a lot. I think the 4 2 4 start, uh, set up when we moved McGree inwards as well, it was a build up problem. And we had a lot of, we were getting caught in transition quite a lot where we'd leave both fullbacks exposed. Now, where you're playing this 3 2 5 and having that lopsided approach, it's actually giving him the space to probably double down on his strengths, get the ball in the box. And try to feed players inwards, and uh, you know his, his direct ball and his crossing across the floor is, is really good and strong. I'd hope I'd see more of it. I thought he was solid yesterday defensively too. I think he does like a little bit of pace, and if you're playing someone who's going to have electric pace, then you've got Bangura there to probably back him up. And for me, he's just started to improve. I think confidence is a massive thing. I think good management from Carrick is probably a good thing as well. Taking him out the side, giving him a couple of games out to come back in and hit the ground run again is also a very positive thing as well. So for me, I think there's an a, a accumulation of a few things. You know, I want to climatise into the UK and how, how, how the football plays, how football's different. The change of system, I think, is massive for him. And then confidence in my management as well. I think they're the reasons why we've seen the improvement. Is he going to be a five-star signing? Obviously, I don't really know, but I'm going to die on that sword and hopefully continues to improve. I think if he did score that rocket, it would have been five star all over. Uh, but yeah, I think that's how he's improved. But there's still a long way to go. I would like to see a lot more of Lucas Engel um, defensively a bit better and try to get a bit more consistency on those crosses. But overall, this game started to improve like the whole team has. And I think that's a really good thing for us as well. And then the, the next question and the final question um, is from Lou. And Tom, I'm going to come to you. And it all rhymes. And uh, what changed <laughs> in recent weeks? What, what has changed in recent weeks, Tom? Um, I mean, it's hard to kind of put your finger on. I think we've we've simplified some things, um, kind of went back to back to basic symptoms of a possession game, starting with Southampton, and then that's kind of evolved on. Um, and you know, we're we're doing a lot better in terms of being solid, keeping the ball, recycling possession, uh, and then creating chances as well. Obviously, we've we've changed system, which you mentioned has has helped helped Engel. Um, I, I think having Coburn up front as as that focal point, and sometimes Crooks as well, um, really to kind of hold the ball off uh, up and lay it off to people is is working quite well for our build up play. Um, and I think one of the key things as well is confidence. We we look a lot more confident now, and so we should after yesterday. Um, 
if we don't come back after the international break, absolutely bring me more confidence. I'll be very surprised because you know the team deserves to be confident at the moment. They're putting in the type of performances which y- you should uh, grow in confidence from, uh, and, and it's only going to help going forward. Yeah, I agree, and hopefully we can do that in, in, in the international break. Work on the work on ironing out some of the the problems that we're kind of having, and, and try to build on something different as well, and keep trying to add dimensions to our game as well. Um, but I'm ready for some praise. Are you ready for some praise? It's the praise in place. Ah, yes, the praise in place. The only place where to give praise to a player, coach or staff member, fans, Dan is uh, background with the board breakdown shirts. No, 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 no. Dan is egg meal sandwiches. Which you weren't here because you were late to this episode. So I was scrolling on them before we went live and he's leaving. Welcome back to the Borough Breakdown <laughs> podcast where Johnny has left because I've got egg meal sandwiches. Tom, what, how do you what feel are you? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus it's not happening Christ. on this podcast. Can we please transfer away. Tom out for that joke, that, that pun that he's just made there about York? Yeah, I thought it was cracking. York. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, well, you fried me up a good one there, Tom. Um, anyway, <laughs> right. Praise and place. I'm going to ignore the egg sandwiches. Tom. I'm not. Who I'm is in... I'm going to ignore you. I'm going to go to Tom now first instead of you. Dinner. I'm going to go to Tom first. Tom, who is in your praise and place this week? I mean, pretty much the whole team, but I just want to kind of mention some some uh, standouts. Dieng. Obviously, for that, that save yesterday, most of all. But, you know, I think he's had two really good games this week. Dan Barlasser, I want to single out as well. It was only on last week's podcast that we were saying, what does he need to do to get into the team and stuff like that? Obviously, what it took was house and getting ill. But he's took his <laughs> chance. I was I was saying <laughs> I was saying last week, what Barlasser needed to work on was progressing the ball and... You know, as I said, the range of passing was never in question. It's the dribbling with the ball and bringing it out midfield. And I think he's done that really well, especially yesterday. Um, and this isn't even, you know, necessarily when we were a man up. Um, this is first half as well. Uh, he was he was doing it really well. And, you know, I, I think it's clear that he's being coached in that way now. It's obviously what we need from the centre midfielders in our system. And he's improving at this um, and, and looking good while he does this. Um, Isaiah Jones, for obvious reasons, um, for he, but like I said, best best game he, I remember him, remember seeing him play for Borough yesterday. And then lastly, uh, Hayden Hackney, um, who for me is becoming possibly my favourite player to watch at, at Borough at the moment for the way he progresses the ball out in midfield. You know, last season we were all at the start of the season thinking how much are we going to miss Tav for for those same reasons. Hayden Hackney's looking so much more polished than Tav ever did for me at the moment. Um, And I I don't think it's it's quite believable given, you know, Hackney's actually younger uh, and he's he's still looking so good at the moment. He's rightfully been called up to England under-21s and it's their favourite player to watch at the moment, I'm sure. He's got a hell of a career ahead of him. He really does, doesn't he, Hayden Hackney? He's starting to, to grow on me more and more. I see him. And for the present place, Tom, there's some good candidates in there as well. But Dana, I'll forgive you for the egg sandwiches. Um, but who's in your present place this week? I'm going to put Michael Carrick in there. I think, obviously, the play is fantastic. But above all, Carrick, I think, deserves praise this week because... It honestly doesn't feel like that long ago that we were podcasting after the Sheffield Wednesday game and it honestly did feel like rock bottom. We titled the episode Disaster because I think that just encompassed the feeling after that game. And Carrick obviously saw fit, saw reason to experiment at the beginning of the season because of different personnel options at his disposal and it wasn't working. And he identified that. He gave it time to potentially work. And he identified that it wasn't, and he he switched back to a similar system as last season. Um, it's more of a two three five at the moment rather than a th- mm. three two five because actually the right back is getting forward as well. So we have that width. We've got the left back 
getting forward very high and wide and we've got the right back very similar as well so I think just having that width and maybe just bringing through the new signings a little bit more patiently rather than throwing them in straight away I think has definitely impacted and produced these better results and it's good to see you know Carrick is not stubborn he he allowed the time for that 4-2-4 to potentially work it didn't he identified that and he's changed it so fair play to Carrick really 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 hats off to him yeah and I think for me on that three or three two uh two three five I cannot wait for Anthony Dykesteel to come back and be fully fit I am very excited to see what he would do Uh, I think he would be fantastic and for me press place everyone I can't I can't pinpoint one person yes it's a cover answer uh, I think the coach and staff deserve a lot of credit. I think the team deserve a lot of credit too for, for bringing back. And also, Senny Dieng is going to be just a, a single out. Brilliant last couple of weeks. Really, really good. I know there's a lot of, there's been a lot of things about him. And if you look at some some of the data and you go, well, why is he like conceding all these things? He's hadn't had a chance in a lot of those chan- uh, opportunities. But what he's shown in the last few games for me, really strong goalkeeper to have at our disposal. Really happy for him. But overall, very, very happy man uh, this week, uh, this weekend. Well, let's do some uh, Bora Birmingham trivia now. Let's look ahead to Birmingham because Bora and uh, Birmingham have played against each other 32 times. Uh, this kind of links in quite nicely to my question and my trivia question for you guys today and for the Bora fans listening and watching us uh, wherever you may be. Um, Bora, play- Bora and Birmingham have played each other 32 times. But how many times have Bora won? Um, Dana and Tom, you 30 seconds. Start now. Thirty seconds is done. Uh, Tom, what are you going for this week? Eighteen. Eighteen I've, from Tom yeah, Green. I feel like thirty-two times is shockingly low for Borough and Birmingham. Mm. Um, yeah, I thought that I, I, too. I feel like we always beat them at home, but we never have much luck away, so it's going to balance out. Yeah, it's, it actually is a little bit more than thirty-two, but they had a different name, so I've, I've actually went. It's actually uh, Birmingham, not. What was it, Small Heath? Yeah, some heat, yeah. That's that was right, right. That's not Villa. Yeah. Sh- yeah. Sh- and, and then, Dan what are you going to go for this week? 17. I was close to Tom's guess, but same kind of uh, thinking, actually. We always seem to lose at St. Andrews, although it's kind of picked up in recent years. But we had a period where we just could not win there, so I feel like somewhere in the middle there. Dynamo, you're correct. It was 17 <laughs> uh, times. You've been looking at the answers in my notes. I have uh, not. I'll have you know, cheeky git. I've actually guessed that. Mr. Paddy McNair's number. I'm just not going to give you it because you had an egg sandwich in the podcast. Oh, um, come on. No, I'll let you have it. It's 17. <laughs> Congratulations, Dana. To, and hopefully to the listeners of yours, if you've been sat wherever you may be, or walking, or doing whatever you want to do when you listen to this podcast, I uh, hope you got 17 as well. If you didn't, you're a loser. Uh, but let's move on yeah, Tom. <laughs> to Birmingham now, because they are currently in the playoff places and had a fantastic start to the season. Tony has done a fantastic job, but there is a lot of rumours they could have a new manager by the time our, uh, this we play them because Wayne Rooney is reported to take over at Birmingham City, which I think is a shocking decision from Birmingham to do that. But we sp- we decided to speak to the wonderful, the amazing Gab Sutton to get some insight on Birmingham so far this season. Absolutely delighted with the season Blues are having so far. I think before the season, um, progress was really the aim. Players were kind of a hope rather than um, rather than an expectation. Um, I certainly think that the way we started, um, certainly being in the top six ahead of ahead of next week's game, um, that there is a bit of optimism that we might be able to have a season that's 
madly ahead of schedule. Um, at the same time, I don't think there's necessarily too much pressure on us to um, to do that. I certainly think from a fan's point of view, it's about building on last season's 17th place finish and, and possibly finishing in the top half, which from what we've seen so far, I'm, I'm very confident that we're gonna, uh, we're gonna do that. Um, really like John Eustace, and there's been a bit of rumours about uh, possibly a managerial change. I know Eustace has been linked with Rangers, not sure about that, but from my point of view, um, completely happy with him. I, I really think that he's the right person to, uh, to, to lead this football club forward. Um, and I'd be saying that even if we weren't sort of where we are, where we are in the league, because I've been so impressed with the work that he's done in terms of coaching individuals, in terms of improving us as a team, and kind of handling some tough circumstances that he came into. You've got to remember that um, when he first took charge of Blues last season, expectation was on the floor. And uh, for us to have finished um, 17th with what was a wafer-thin squad, there wasn't an awful lot of scope to sort of change things around last season when results went... um, uh, went south. Uh, I think that was a difficult moment for him, but he um, he kind of got us to uh, to to a decent finish. Um, yeah, so I think um, Jay Stansfield has really been the uh, the one to watch so far this season. I think is the uh, the pace that he's brought us in the uh, in the final third. It's something completely different to what we've had previously, um, and and he's made it. It's made us just such a more exciting side to watch, and it's it's kind of energising watching Birmingham at the moment, as opposed to maybe our energy sapping, which it has been um, has been in the past. So I think that's a really exciting thing. So Ricky Dembele's uh, starting to come into form. Uh, we've got a pretty consistent back four as well. So um, I think we're uh, we're going to be a dangerous team. Obviously, your lot uh, are in really good form as well with with four straight victories. But um, I think we're uh, we're feeling good right now. Um, but it's a lovely position to be in. I think next season, if we're still in the championship, then obviously the expectation rises. But for this season, I think it's almost more fun in the sense that it's just a case of enjoying the ride and enjoying uh, having a team that plays with pride, that plays with courage, that plays um, with quality as well. Um, I think it's a really exciting time to be a Blue yeah, thank you very much uh, for that, Gab. Um, and you'll see me on Gab Shaw this Wednesday when I talk about Bora as well. Um, but obviously, there's more breaking news as we even recording as well. And uh, it says that Rooney's going to be taken up with John O'Shea and Ashley Cole, and it could be like it could be done for this Jesus. week. Um, so breaking, I know, insane that is even happening. But anyway, um, the game what's coming up? Uh, obviously, it's going to be very different um, if there is a new manager in charge. What's the? Well, let's have a take a step back and. There's times where we play Birmingham City um, at the Riverside, and there's been some unbelievable moments in that time. But Tom, have you got any anything that comes to mind when we've when we've played Birmingham in the past? Yeah, the the one game that comes to mind for me is that first home game in the playoff season. I think it was um, where we did that free kick routine that was executed absolutely perfectly until Kike had straight the keeper uh, for, <laughs> for the so last part of it. I think we won that one 2-0. Uh, and, yeah, it was uh, obviously a good start of that season. But, yeah, I can just never forget that free-kick routine. And for you, Dana, what have you got for, for yours? Well, what immediately came to my mind was that god-awful nil-nil draw against them where I'm pretty sure this is the same game. Didn't Nugent fling one of their players on the floor and get sent off? Pretty sure that was the same game. And then... There was also a match under Italka Rank. I think this is his first season, actually, 13-14, where we beat them 3-1. I'm pretty sure we were down to, down to nine men. And I remember that game because the atmosphere was actually really good. The Riverside was sparsely populated back then, let's be honest. But the atmosphere, actually, it felt like it was almost near full capacity. The fans really got behind the players that day. And that was one of those games that sticks in the memory just because it was you don't really expect that type of atmosphere from probably 13 between 13 or 15,000 crowd and it was a, an excellent atmosphere and a really good win as well yeah and the, they're two really good memories to have but mine actually dates back to what two, <laughs> that two, no, no one isn't. um no it is you've got to think of it then it's building it somewhere <laughs> um <but> the, <laughs> mine Mine is uh one was in two thousand and four, and there's one player that I always think of when I think of Birmingham City. And he was Mikel Farcel. I don't know if people can remember him. Um, and like this bleached blonde hair. Uh, I think he's Finnish. I think yeah, it sounds Finnish. Um, he's not twenty eight. Tom, I was I was waiting for you to come in. 
Um, I was waiting for it to come in as well. I, I was actually going to say, sounds like he's the uh, the first evolution stage of Marcus Force. <laughs> yeah, I was also yes. thinking that too. Yeah. <laughs> Pre-evolution. Weird, yeah, weirdly players like him as well. And yeah, I remember the game. I was obviously there with my dad and my uncle and it was just an off-it game. I think it was like 4-2 at half time. And uh, there was so much going on. I think Southgate scored. I want to say Mendieta. Macaroni definitely got one. And look, I think I got two. Two before half time. I can't remember who scored the last one. Two. I think it was Nemeth that got our last one. But I could be wrong. I feel like I'm going to get like corrected in, in our comments. But I think it was, yeah, <laughs> Mendieta, Macaroni, Southgate, and Nemeth. Um, but what a game. You know, that was like the real. The real seasons, you know, that's what that's when we were amazing to watch at home and and uh, and uh, uh Steve McLaren. But anyway, guys, uh, obviously, this game in particular, obviously, a lot can change. New manager as well, bounce, uh, even don't even need bounce because they're doing all well, they're doing really well already. But what's your prediction, Tom? What do you think the, the score will be? 2 0 Borough. I, I think we, we come back after international break, full of confidence, same form, uh, and and keep another clean sheet. So, 2 0 from you, Denmark. What are you going to go for? No, I was thinking 2 0 as well. I th- yeah, head to head, 11 Borough wins, five draws, six Birmingham victories. Maybe they do a win, but I'm going to go with a 2 0 Borough victory. Yes, and I'm going to go with, I'm going to say one all draw, um, mainly just because that new manager feeling, and I'm just thinking, mm, we you just don't know what he's going to be bringing up to, to bring to the table, do you? So we'll see. Uh, what that will bring but that's in a couple of weeks time but for right now Borough fans enjoy this moment we've won five in a row we're unbeaten in six we're flying but Tom have you got a bet for us uh, for the rest of the for the next game is there anything that you you want to leave the fans with and waiting for, for next week or week after? I mean I, I don't particularly want to leave them with it because I've had good uh, good success in predicting the scorers the last couple of games against Cardiff I had Jones every time uh, any time which I had to do after Vandenberg wasn't in the team. Uh, so I, I kind of like redid it and put Jones, he scored. And then I was let down with Borough and, and well, no, with Cardiff not getting enough corners. Um, and then yesterday I had Greenwood anytime and I was let down by Hackney and the chewiest person in the North East, usually Luke or Nine, both not getting yellow cards, let me down for 110 quid. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to go with, um, you know what, let's say Coburn a score in the next game. But don't quote me on any other stack because it's, it's clearly that I can't pick them. Well, thank you very much for that, Tom. So don't put your life savings on it because if Tom's not confident, it probably actually will happen. So let me do. Um, let me do. But for right now, guys, thank you very much, guys, for joining me as always to the listeners and the viewers. Thank you very much for watching us, listening to us. Don't forget, to get, uh, don't forget to give us a five star rating on your podcast provider and give us a thumbs up on this video and subscribe. And we're very, very close to 2,000 subscribers on YouTube. And yeah, it'd be great if we could achieve that as well. Uh, but for right now, embrace it, drink it in. We're formidable. This has been the Board Breakdown podcast, and that was all over a match chair in a pod. Up the Board Breakdown. Up the Border. 4 0.